But in hindsight, you go, oh, my, hey, that's an incredible encounter. Yeah, yeah I mean, how often does that happen? Aloha, folks. Welcome back to Spike's Breezeway Cocktail Hour. I have been good friends with Ron Farrell here for a long time, and I've always seen photos of his incredible home tiki bar that it's taken like 10, 15 years to something like that to yeah. finally make it here. So I would like to welcome you to the Rincon Room. Oh, and this is Ron. Sorry. Aloha. Your home bar is shocking. It is bad. It's not, it's not bad. His collection in the bar is incredible. When you go inside the house, it's like what five times what you have in the bar. We're not going in the house. Well, no, we're not going to go. That we're not going to the house, but the collection out here is amazing. And especially you have collected a lot of really big teams. Yes. What was the one that you showed us when we came in? The Trade Winds, the local Polynesian restaurant that was here in Ventura County. Right. And you have like the logo tiki. Yes. That was out on the island in the lake out in front of this A-frame wonder, what I call the Maikai of the West. You also have like an incredible collection of Oceanic Arts tiki's. Yes. But like 15 foot deep. 13 to be correct, but I would call it 15 feet. Guys' measurements aren't always that exact. Well, I don't <laughs> I said always. <laughs> I don't even want to touch that one. <laughs> don't, don't touch it. The stuff that you've been able to accumulate, it should be in a museum. It's like Some historical it, yeah. stuff. Some of it is historical and museum quality, but most of it's just... Uh, Chachki. You and I both basically started our, our education in Tiki around the same time at the, the birth of Tiki Central, right? Yes, I was a little bit earlier. I mean, I kind of grew up with going to Trader Vic's, John the Beachcomber, Rahuka right. in West Cabina. Mm -hmm. I'm that old. What is your attraction to all of this? Um, it was probably the tie-in to the Mysterious when it was uh, Pacific Ocean Park because I was so young then that I didn't understand what it was, but it looked exotic. And then a little later when I was getting into surfing and surf movies like Ride the Wild Surf, you know, totally authentic Hawaiian surfing. <laughs> and then the tie-ins to that, I remember when I was transitioning from Pacific Ocean Park to Disneyland, mm -hmm. when the Enchanted Tiki Room opened, and I have a story about Walt Disney that I met once at Disneyland. You met Walt Disney? Yes when they were building Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse. But that's another story. Going to Adventureland and having all the, that, the kiosk, the little bins full yeah. of shrunken heads and rubber snakes and little tiki's. You know they've taken all the shrunken heads and skulls out of Adventureland? I've heard that, and we're but we're not doing that here. No. I'm not owned by Disney Corporation yet. So. And we're certainly not doing that at the Breezeway. In okay. fact, I'm gonna be adding more shrunken heads and more skulls. Well, I would too, if I was allowed to. Oh. So. It seems like you have a very tolerant wife because you said that you're- I do. She's very into like mid-century modern stuff, like yeah. clean lines and stuff. Yeah. And the tour that you just gave me, it seems that your tiki collection has taken over the house. I had nothing to do with that. It just happened. Mm -hmm. It's uh, magic and mystery. They multiply like uh... Yeah, at night. It's like Minahunis. Oh, like Minahunis! So you have a signature cocktail for this bar. Yes, we do. And it is named after an area you saw as you came in. There's a little covered patio, kind of beachcomber style that we call Drifter's Reef. So we named our signature cocktail the Drifter's Reef, which is on the menu at Ventiki. Oh, yeah. So if you've been to Ventiki in Ventura, then you can order the cocktail there. Yeah. It's almost as good as if you had it here. But. Almost. So, for this cocktail, we will be using oranges, lemon juice, orange curacao, orgeat, and then, normally, because this is a Demerara forward cocktail, mm -hmm. all the rums are Demerara rums, I make a Demerara simple syrup, which I neglected to do today, so we're just gonna use some cane syrup. Oh, okay. And then the rums. The rums, we will start with Eldorado Five Year Demerara Rum. Lemon Heart 1804. Okay, I've never had Lemon Heart 1804. If you go to the Tiki Tea, you can order an 1804 Zombie. Oh. And you'll find it quite tasty. Hmm. Pro tip. Okay. And then uh, I just have a little bit of this Skipper Demerara Rum. We will do that as a float to float your boat, maybe. And that's it, simple. Okay, so let's uh, get into the cocktail. Let me see where my stuff is. I use this 
because I can make several drinks at a time. So we're gonna start with three ounces of orange juice. Per cocktail. Per cocktail, six ounces. Okay. And as you can see, I've been bartending for about 65 years now, or 65 minutes. <laughs> but as we've said on the show, that it's all about caring about the ingredients and caring about proportions and yeah. You're not, you're not Tom Cruise in cocktail. I don't expect you to be flipping around. No, one of us would get hurt or both of us would get hurt. <laughs> the next ingredient will be your fresh squeezed lemon juice. This, we're going to do one ounce. One ounce per cocktail of lemon juice. So we're going to do two ounces so that we can each have a cocktail. Oh, yes. And I think in this device I could make four drinks. But oh. we're only going to do two. Okay. That's why I use this. And I'm not a professional, so. Either am I. So we're going to add a little bit of Demerara syrup, but we're actually just using some cane simple syrup. And we're going to use, like a Mai Tai, we're going to use a quarter ounce, so we'll do a half ounce for two drinks. Okay. So just do a quarter ounce. All right. How long did it take you to come up with this cocktail? Well, it's funny you should ask, Spike. I'm sure you've done this. When you're trying to come up with a cocktail, is you start making cocktails, and somehow they get better the more cocktails you have. So yeah, it's hard. It's very dangerous. It is. The first time you do it, you make two or three cocktails, and you're like, okay, I'm done. I yeah. think that was good. Yeah. It's better to make a cocktail than maybe just have a taste of it, mm -hmm. write down your ingredients, and then make another one. Mm -hmm. Have a taste of it, write down your ingredients, and so on. Yeah, instead of drinking three separate cocktails, and by the end, you're like, this is the best thing I've ever had. And, and then you go back to it, and you make it, and you go, what in the, I must have been... Yeah, you make it the next drunk. day, and you're like, that's horrible. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do some orjat, Okay. and we're going to do the same thing, quarter ounce per drink. So we've got two drinks, so we're doing a half an ounce. And then we're going to do some dry curacao. Okay. This will be half ounce per drink, so we'll do an ounce for two drinks. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a Mai Tai, doesn't it? It does sound like a Mai Tai, except for the orange juice and the... And the lemon, the lemon juice. juice. Well, yeah. we did that to make it a little more refreshing because I think I did this in the summertime. The orange juice really makes kind of like a summer fresh mm -hmm. cocktail. Which so. is perfect for right now, seeing how it's 62 degrees out it's here. A, it's a heat wave. <laughs> We're burning up here. I'm gonna add my Angostura bitters. Okay. This is kind of a what I call a free pour, or basically you're gonna do like anywhere from four to six dashes per drink. So we're gonna oh. do about that. That's about 12 to 15. <laughs> Drops. All right. It's approximate. Your mileage may vary. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to do rums. Okay. So this I, is the fun part. I got here. them over here. So let's start with the El Dorado, five year. Okay. Nice, smoky Demerara. So we're going to do an ounce and a half. Let me make sure I don't get you too drunk. We're going to do three ounces. Okay. So now we're going to do the Lemon Heart 1804. Okay. 1804 Zombie at TTT. Don't forget that. Yep. And we're going to do the same thing. Ounce and a half per drink, so that means we're going for three ounces. Or if Spike happened to leave right now, I'd have a nice cocktail. Are you asking me to leave? No. So you can drink all this yourself? No. This will save for a float. Huh. The uh, skipper is a float. You can use some good old Lemon Heart Demerara. You can use that as a float, which is what I used to do before it got hard to find. So I think that's pretty much it. See, it's just it's just uh, fun in the glass. And then you just kind of shake it up. Okay. You want to put some ice in there or no? Nope. No ice, dry shake. And the only reason is because since I'm going to pour this in an unknown amount into a glass, I just want to make sure the glasses have the ice in it. Oh, okay. And then because of the Demerara rums, and especially if you do a float, mm -hmm. sometimes you'll sip it for a while, so it allows the ice to melt. And it might be a little strong at first, right. but pretty soon you're going, you know, I'm really liking this drink. Oh, it's so it kind of involves. Or the, yeah, or the rum kicks in and you're going, I'm really liking this drink. <laughs> Totally. That's interesting. So, okay, cool. That's it. So okay. Now what are we I using? Will, these guys? Uh, what would you like to use? Would you like to use some standard these? Rincon Room Rocks Glass? Yeah. Let's do it in the Rincon Room. Unfortunately, I, these are like the last ones I have. Okay. So, so you can't buy these anywhere. You can't buy these anywhere. Okay. Unavailable. This would have been a great advertisement for you. Look at this ice bucket you have. Look at the one over there. Oh my. Look at this one. It's a porthole. That. That blew my mind at, over at, at Alan's house. Yeah. Because I'd never seen that before. And everybody's like, yeah, dude, it's the most common ice bucket ever. Well, like, he's, he saw it here and he wanted to find one, so he was on the hunt to get one. Oh. I had a couple of them, and I think I sold my extras at like Tiki Oasis. But then the porthole one, 
This that was an ice bucket, or you made this? It, no, it was an ice bucket. So that's a cool random find. All of your stuff is cool random finds. I pretty much. His yeah. collection is shocking. If you're like, oh yeah, do you have that? He's like, uh, yeah, I got a couple of those. Like random, rare stuff. And I'm gonna have to show you the, the whole bar. We'll take a quick little tour or whatever. But it's um the amount of art and uh, ephemera is shocking. That's what my wife says. So. <laughs> the greatest person I ever married. <laughs> Shake it and pour. And we'll let the the ice melt on that and it'll water it down a little bit. We're not in any hurry. But wait, there's more. So now we're gonna do a little finish, mm -hmm. a little float, and it, it's mainly like for color. Oh. But the flavor's not bad either. So we'll uh, float a Skipper Demerara rum, or like I said, if you have some Lemon Heart 1804, mm -hmm. it just makes a nice little color on top of the drink. And yeah. I like to use glasses rather than mugs so that you can see the color of the drink. Totally. And I'm sure that many of you out there in Great Cocktail Hour Land would agree with me. We're gonna use some uh, Las Cargo swizzles that I designed. Okay. Don't do a whole lot of stirring, let it mellow, and voila. And so, from the Rincon Room here in, where are we, Camarillo? Yes. This is the Drifter's Reef. Thank you. <laughs> Aloha from the Rincon Room. So we've added a little bit of mint to this also. Man, I've seen you post about this cocktail for years. And I'm so excited to finally get to taste it. Well, the people at Ventiki liked it so much they wanted to add it to their menus. It's delicious. Now, I was telling Spike, originally it wasn't called Drifter's Reef. A lot of the ingredients were shared with a Mai Tai except for the lemon and orange juice. Mm -hmm. I called it a Lai Tai. Lai Tai? Lai Tai or Drifter's Reef? Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's refreshing. Yeah. It's the orange juice, I think, does that. Yeah. Super refreshing. And, but you definitely taste the Demerara, which is a, like one of my favorite flavors in Tiki. I love Demerara rums. Kind of a boozy one, huh? It is boozy. The oh, the train's here. It's going to pick us up. Fortunately, we don't have to drive. The ship's coming in. Man, that's so good. That's a great cocktail. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. Totally. And it, it you know, it's my, my wife approved of it, so that was uh, that was key. Yeah. Well, you... <laughs> Yeah. Well, because I want something that she could drink too. Of course. And it's very popular at Ventiki. Mm -hmm. I mean, their Mai Tai is the biggest seller, but mm -hmm. this is a big seller. Because it has a good look, and they serve it in a hurricane glass. Oh, okay. So it looks big. Mm -hmm. When people order it, all of a sudden everybody starts ordering. I oh. want that. I want that. And then it just spreads through the bar. I got to say, the presentation of the cocktails will oftentimes get people to order that exact drink. Okay. because. You look over and you go, what's the thing that's on fire? Or we were just at the Madonna Inn. What's that drink that comes in like a, kind of a hurricane glass, but it's pink and it's got a... Not the pink cloud, is it? Pink cloud? The pink cloud, yeah. which is a ridiculous cocktail. But the minute that anybody sees it, they go, uh, I want the pink thing with the... With the cloud. And I'm so glad that we were finally able to do this. The Hula Girls were just performing up in Morro Bay, right past you, well, a couple hours past you. Yeah. So we were able to come back down and do this. But I want to know more about the building of your bar. Because you told me earlier that when you moved into the house, that the backyard was just basically a grass backyard. Yeah. Well, now there's a river running through it. <laughs> yes. Originally, we lived in a mid century modern house in Eichler. With very clean lines, very uncluttered, mm -hmm. very more like my wife. And less Queen like lines me. and uncluttered? Yes, she's very <laughs> uncluttered. But we did decide to build a room after we had gone to a couple of home parties and looking in the Book of Tiki mm -hmm. and seeing all these cool restaurants and bars and what people were doing with their home bars. Mm -hmm. And I thought, we need to do something like that. It would be perfect. Yep. We had a little laundry room off the kitchen between the patio, so it was a perfect place. Kitchen was nearby, and the pool in the backyard was right there. Mm -hmm. So we decided to put a a tiki bar in that laundry room, but it was small. It was nine by 11. Yeah. So we had that for a couple of years and then we moved here and we didn't really have room in the house because it's kind of a Brady Bunch split level mm -hmm. that was access to the kitchen and convenient to have a bar. So my wife said, you have that big backyard, why don't you just build it out there? And I'm like, all right. <laughs> just like, all right. right. Yeah. So we built this. But you went from a grass backyard to literally dirt. Well, d yeah, to dirt eventually, but then uh, then it's all paved and there's a river running through it and it's plumbed with, with gas tiki torches. And it's one of the best, if not the best home tiki bar I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. 
the nice thing about the gas torches is they don't blow out in high winds. If you can put in gas torches, I highly recommend it. Do they cost a lot to operate? No, the BTUs, the amount of gas that it uses, like each torch is probably equivalent to a small furnace. Huh. But if you have 12 torches, you got 12 furnaces running. So <laughs> you can, I mean, but you're only yeah. going to run them for two to four to six hours. Or if you're having a party, they might be on for eight or ten. Yeah, but you don't come out here and light them every night, right? No, just you when we have company. You don't have a ceremony where you take your shirt off and, and run through here with drums playing? <laughs> and a coconut bra and a banana hammock. So, uh, no, I don't do that. Oh, okay. But if I was paid enough... Uh, so the, the building process you went through and you pulled permits for everything and it's it was all a, yeah it's all permitted uh -huh. and there's even a bathroom in the back with a shower because he has a hot tub over here too well i'm a contractor so i was able to do a lot of this building myself and mm -hmm. with help of, of a friend to do the framing i did use a contractor for the concrete that is stamped like wood mm -hmm. which is nice for cleanups after a party for my messy bartending. <laughs> I can just get a mop and clean it up really quick. After building such an elaborate tiki bar, do you have advice for somebody who wants to build their own home tiki bar? What's one thing that pops into your head and you go, this is something that is imperative? Well, if these event managers would have me do another symposium on how to build your tiki bar. Oh. But for you guys, for Spike's Breezeway Cocktail Hour, we're gonna give you some tips. Oh. I'd say the first thing is if it's going to have a lot of electrical, which I recommend, more outlets the better because you're going to have more lamps than you think you're going to have. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have an electrician and if you're going to have plumbing in the bar, you really want to have a professional. You don't want to do that yourself because myself as a contractor and former real estate inspector, I will come in and rip it the new one. I don't want you to ever come into the breezeway and see the electrical mess that I have made. I will bring my notepad. Oh, uh, the thing is, is that I don't want you to have a fire. I don't either. Electrical fire, and I don't want you to have a plumbing flood. So those are the two things that you probably don't want to cut corners on. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that Spike's making mega dollars, he could probably afford to, to do that. So, but yes, the the tips there would be hire an electrician, hire a plumber for those parts. Mm -hmm. um, I hired the concrete done. I hired drywall in here before the finishes were put on, and I hired an electrician mm -hmm. to run outlets. But the rest of it I did myself. My wife painted all the corrugated metal panels to look rusty. Yeah, it's man, it's really impressive. Thanks. It's a really cool, I always think of these as kind of like art projects, you know? It is, like I get envious a little bit when I see these great artists, McBiff and uh, guys like that. There's a many, Shag and yeah. Doug Horn, mm -hmm. and I can draw barely. I could, <laughs> I could sketch this building, but yeah. I, I come from more of a building thing. I built a bar. I built lamps mm -hmm. for Bintiki, Smuggler's Cove, Halle Pele, Inside Passage. So I mean, Tiki Tony told me once, he goes, that is your art. Yeah. You are an artist. Mm -hmm. So I'll take that. You almost did kind of have like a second career in creating tiki decor, right? You were making these portholes, right? Yeah, I did some cast portholes. Mm -hmm. Made tiki mugs. Mugs. You even had a kiln kind of on the yeah. side of your house. I had a kiln. Yeah. I made a few mugs, three or four different mugs, a skull mug. Here, let me show you one of my... This was my pygmy skull mug. Wow. And this is nice. You can just hold it in your hand and suck its brains out. So I did a skull mug. I did a Papua New Guinea drum mug and mm. kind of a log mug and one other one. But then I decided it's too much work because I am basically lazy. As you can see, this is the lazy man's tiki bar. This doesn't seem very lazy to me. No, but when it came <laughs> to doing mugs, I saw just how difficult it was. Making the original sculpt, mm. doing the plaster forms, and then the pour, the mm. cleaning of lines, the firing, the glazing, which is the part that I hated the most. And so it makes you appreciate. I think everybody should make their own mug so that they can appreciate when they see a mug that's like $65 or $100 and go, I think it's outrageous, but when you've made one, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Sure. Now, it's different if it's made in China. Yeah. And I appreciate Tiki Farm. I like some of their mugs. Yeah. And especially some of their new glazes. Uh -huh. And Monk Tiki. But guys like Van Tiki and John Mulder and you know, Ethan Bookham, they're making amazing pieces of art. Yeah. You know, Crazy Al. These are artists. It's yeah. not just a mug to drink out of. Mm -hmm. It's actually a piece of art to drink out of. Absolutely. Your collection inside of all your vintage mugs, I kept going, oh my, you get that one? And you get that one? I love the vintage... <laughs> I love the modern stuff, but I love the vintage stuff almost more because it's like a, a view into the past. And you go, this mug was sitting in one of these tiki bars and people were enjoying it listening to 
you know, Martin Denny or Perla Panda. Well, that's why when I was collecting menus for a long time, mm -hmm. I actually liked the ones that had a, a, like a glass ring stain on it because that right. meant it was used and it's not just some pristine yeah. souvenir thing. It was like a used in place. Could have been by somebody famous. Who yeah. knows? But I like the history. And, and I originally, when I was collecting stuff, I was more into all the vintage stuff. Mm -hmm. I was not collecting much art of the newer artists. Oh, right. I had a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah. My main focus was vintage. But then I saw, like, uh, Danny Giardo, uh -huh. Tiggy Diablo, did some mugs that had kind of a vintage feel to them. And that's when I, like, I bought some of his mugs. Right. And, and he sculpted the Hula Girls mug also. And very, very talented guy. Incredible artist. Bought early Bosco stuff, which I love. Yeah. The kind of modern look on it. Yeah, modern primitive kind of aesthetic that he does. And then, of yep. course, my neighbor and good friend, Tiki Tony. I liked his whimsical, cartoonish mm -hmm. stuff. And it looks like he even illustrated the backs of your, your glassware. He did. This is Aloha from the Rincon Room. Uh -huh. And he sketched this fit on a napkin. And I go, oh, that's cool. First we were talking about, let's make some napkins with that. And he yeah. goes, why don't you do a glass? And I go, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, I bought Papua New Guinea stuff from you and your wife at Tiki Oasis, I think, a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Do you just have so much stuff that you, you, you have to offload it at things like Tiki Oasis? I brought the extra three pieces because I knew that this guy would be a sucker for it. So <laughs> in this area, there's not as there wasn't as many hunters and collectors until then. Tiki came along. Right, right. So I could find a lot of stuff. Right. And it was like more than I could really use when I would vend at an event like Tiki Oasis or Hookie Lao. Mm -hmm. Is I would make my lamps. And then to supplement. Add, yeah, yeah, supplement what I was had because my booth would always look like a Sparse. the most amazing thrift store you ever saw. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I would have Papua New Guinea and vintage stuff, mm -hmm. extra mugs that I had, so it would just be filled with random mm -hmm. art and my stuff. Knowing that I was going to vend if I saw an extra Tiki Leilani mug that yeah. I already have six of, right. and I find two more, uh -huh. I would just buy them to sell at Tiki Oasis. Uh, one of the things I love about your bar is that it's done in the traditional style. When you come in here, there's no way that you can possibly see everything the first time around. And it's layers and layers of stuff. Yeah, people that come over regularly will uh -huh. constantly ask me, is that new? Uh -huh. And I'll say, no, that was here. Yeah. They say, I remember that, and I'll say, I, I just got that. So it's... But you're also so good at layering that even into into corners where you almost can't see in there, you've put stuff because it adds the illusion of depth. Yeah, you really have to look. That's what yeah. gets... Because people aren't going to want to come back and see me. They want to see what's in the bar. So I have to put little hidden Easter eggs to get them to come back because the drinks, eh, you know, the bartender is pretty shaky. <laughs> I don't, this is a great cocktail, I'll tell you. Thank that. you. Yeah. So what I, you know, like way hidden up in the back, mm -hmm. there's a Maikai black velvet painting, which yeah. you really wouldn't even know it was there unless you really looked close or if I pointed it out to you. It would probably be better if it was more prominent, mm -hmm. but I want it to be like a hidden jewel. What is your favorite tiki that you've collected? And I mean like big wooden carving tiki. Probably our logo tiki, the Rincon Room tiki that we got from Oceanic Arts that was for a bar in Marina Del Rey called Waikiki Wallies. Okay. But each one has its own little story. Like the Trade Winds Tiki is not as tall, but it's yeah. wider and has more local history. So that's probably one of my favorites, but it's like picking your favorite child. So, <laughs> although I could do that, <laughs> even though I don't have children. Oh, so. you know, you even have stuff from Sam Seafood, which for me, that was like, that was my spot. With the Hula Girls, we performed at, at Don the Beachcomber, which was Sam's yes. Seafood, for about a decade. And so then when you showed me that tiki that you, you found, it looks like it came right out of the Dagger Bar. Without being painted clown colors. Without being painted clown colors. <laughs> we were in an antique store one day. My wife is really good about doing this. She has a better eye than I do, so I will miss stuff all the time. So we're in this antique store, and I'm, going, I'm just looking around. She goes, you didn't want that? Sam Seafood mug? And I'm like, oh, what Sam Seafood mug? She goes, this one back over here that I walked by. So what is the Sam Seafood mug? It's a Moai mug. It's is a brown one. Oh, brown. Brown Moai oh, okay. with the Sam Seafood decal. Right. It has a, the name and then the swordfish on it. And they had two of them. So I now I hadn't been to Sam Seafood yet. So I thought, this looks new. 
Oh. I don't know if I'm going to buy this. Oh, one. no. Yes. I'm that smart. Did you leave them? I bought one and I oh. left the other one. But a friend of mine went back that lives in the area. Oh, okay. And bought the other one. Oh, so. The early days of Tiki Central. I was like new to Tiki and everything. And I, we were all discovering everything together. It was really fun. Yes, it was neat. Uh, Tiki Central was like a, a Tiki bulletin board website thing in the early 2000s that we all kind of gathered on. And that's how this happened. The good thing is on that message board, because mm -hmm. people would say, hey, I'm going to have a party and it's open to anybody on this board. So yeah. randomly, you just go to somebody's house in Redondo Beach. Mm -hmm. Here's all these people that are now kind of famous in the Tiki world. Totally. All from various walks of life, which was, but we all had a shared interest. Yeah. So that was what was cool, is we all had this Absolutely. shared interest. And so it was kind of like the start, and I kind of missed those days. And that was why we did too. this. Mm -hmm. So we thought, I want to have a place where we can recreate those great times um, and those parties. We used to have a lot of parties, but we kind of calmed it down when it, because it kept getting bigger and bigger. It went from 50 people to 150 people and cops uh -huh. showing up. And oh, wow. I don't do that anymore. The early days of Tiki Central, uh, I discovered Sam Seafood. I was the one who discovered it. People, okay, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> people, especially Sabu, like played along. They're like, "Oh, really? What's this place you're talking and about?" Doctor Z. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, "No, you guys gotta see it. There's like all these tropical plants out front, and there's like a waterfall and a." They're like, Sam Seafood? Yeah, sure. They were just uh, stringing me along. And then finally, like, Sabu was like, I'll meet you there. And my friends, because, you know, I was in my early 20s at the time. You know, the internet and everything was kind of new. And they're like, wait, you're going to meet some guy? We got the same reaction, like, going to a party. They'd say, oh, who's having a party? Is it someone we know? And I go, no, just some people we met on the internet. <laughs> This sounds creepy. It's so funny because now it seems like not a big deal. No. But back then you go, uh, what? Some message board and you're going to, was this some sex party? <laughs> I hope not. With a guy named Sabu the Coconut Boy? And Dr. Z? <laughs> Who's not a doctor? But yeah. Oh man. Yeah, those were fun times. What I've told Sven and Jeff Barry and people that were really pioneers and all this tiki and cocktail culture is they brought people together and then all this community brought out the artists in them. People that may not have been big artists, but they tried their hand. Like if you look at Dave Hansen, Lake Surfer, who was an amazing carver, yep. his early works were a little crude and rough, but I'm sure everybody that started out wasn't like polished. Yeah. So yeah, I think it brought people and you see somebody make a lamp. That's how I started making lamps. Yeah. Well, first seeing stuff at Oceanic Arts and then a couple of my friends, Polynesiac, oh, saw yeah. them making lamps, and I thought, I'm going to try that. Because I was doing the same thing, and it was almost more like, I think I can do that. Then, you know, like, almost kind of proving it to yourself that you can uh, create something for your own bar. Well, which is what I did at first. I made a yeah. couple lamps for our bar, and then people would come over, oh, can you make one for me? Or yeah. maybe you should sell those. And right. I thought, okay, oh, I can copy that. But then I, I, I get bored easy. Yep. So I would make a few lamps and like, oh, this is like a job. Yeah. I already had a job, so I didn't want another job. It becomes a job very quickly. Yes. Yeah. Fun as it is. I remember one bar <laughs> builder telling me one time, I said, man, you've got it made. You get to make all these cool tiki bars. He goes, after a while... It's just a job. Which... Yeah. When you take your fun thing and you turn it into a business, then sometimes the fun thing becomes a business. What, hey, what's your favorite tiki bar? That's a loaded question. Now, there's a moratorium on the show that you're not allowed to say the mic guy. That's why I say it's a loaded question. So I'm going to say the trade wins. Ooh. Only because I never got to go there and it was the most amazing local uh -huh. Polynesian restaurant that was around from like 62 to 78 and then it became a Don the Beachcombers. When Urban Cowboy came out, that movie Urban mm -hmm. Cowboy was a big craze, mm -hmm. Don the Beachcomber closed and it became the Hawaiian Cowboy. And they, took out some of the, they took out some of the booths and put in barbecue pits and they had a, the riding bowl thing, the mechanical bowl. And so they, like, Hawaiian cowboy, Paniola, Paniola you know, yeah, yeah. And, and then it closed and became uh, something else. It was an ice cream parlor. Oh, elaborate. Yeah, wow. elaborate ice cream parlor. But just for, like, a year or so, it didn't make it. When, when we were talking earlier, you called that the Mai Kai West. Basically because of the A-frame, the huge size, 
the huge lake out front that had the island with the tiki on it. Mm. They had a full-size Chinese junk in the lagoon out in front of the restaurant. Like a big Chinese boat? Like a big Chinese junk boat. If they're called Chinese junks with their cool sails. Yeah, don't get all weird on this. Yeah. That's what they're called. When they were open, they would raise the sails on this, this boat, on this junk. Yeah. And when they were closed, they would lower the sails. But if you stayed in the nearby hotel, the Wagon Wheel Motel, which was built by the same person, um, Martin Bud Smith, who had a boat in the Channel Islands Harbor called the Dry Martini. He did a lot of development in, in Ventura County. So he built this motel, and then he built this Polynesian restaurant. If you stay at the motel and you call and you want to get dinner at the restaurant, they would come pick you up in a rickshaw, they would take you over to the restaurant, and you would have appetizers and cocktails in the Chinese junk, which no sat like eight to 10 people. Yeah. And then you go in for the full Polynesian floor show, bands like the Beach Boys, Martin Denny, Dick Dale and Dale Town. So they, it was like a full on experience with the Polynesian floor show, just like the Maikai. Unlike the Maikai, it didn't make it. Mm -hmm. So we're rooting for the Maikai, and the Maikai wins yes. that. It's not East Coast versus West Coast. It's uh, Maikai wins, but I'll take the trade wins only because it's local to me. I've said it, I think a bunch on the show, is that every once in a while, I find out about something new that was old, but it's new to me. And you go, I can't believe that was a thing. That there was a lagoon out in front of this restaurant with a big old Chinese ship in it. Like, and it, it gets me so excited about Tiki all over again because it was such a creative thing. It really was, and it, it died down when the time that Polynesian pot became out of step. Right. So it, it suffered the same fate as most restaurants did. Right. It's sad when you look back and see what could have been. Mm -hmm. it, it's like that roller coaster ebb and flow. Yeah. It, had they stayed around long enough, like the Maikai, mm -hmm. they would have seen the rebirth yeah. and the popularity come back and hopefully, you know, get them out of the financial depths. One of the things that I love about your home bar here is your bridge that comes over the uh, the water feature. Uh -huh. And uh, the reason that I love that is because that goes to the whole idea of transporting yourself over the metaphorical boundary into this false Polynesia. What I did do is there's three main supports for the bridge. I screwed it to the edge supports, but I didn't screw it to the middle support. And what that does is when you step on it, it kind of bounces. So it has a little noise. Because originally we wanted to do a suspension bridge, yeah. but that's way too elaborate. And I thought, drunk, test, and liability. So oh. we just went with a regular bridge, but I wanted to make it have a little noise. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll have to walk across that again and see if I can hear the noise. Yeah, some people notice it, some don't. Yeah. You, just, you think that's just how it is. Yeah. But if I had screwed the center down, it would be totally quiet. Yeah, of course. And we've had huge parties, like I said, up to 150 people. We've had like 20, 30 people on that bridge taking pictures, and it's like, is that going to fall in? But it, it hasn't, so. And also, it's not like they're falling to their death. It's like, you know, a couple feet. It's 20 inches. 20 inches. Per code. Ron, thank you so much for joining me on Spike's Breezy Cocktail Hour. Thank you for having me and us at the Rimcon Room. Well, thanks for coming. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. I've seen the Hula Girls many times. Um, Whether you wanted to or not. Yeah, and I just felt like maybe you just didn't like me, so. Oh my god. <laughs> I wanted to give you this Breezeway Cocktail Hour pin. Oh, thank you. And the only way you get this pin is if you are on the show or if you're a member of the Patreon, so. Well, thank you so much. I really Certainly. appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, I'd say anybody that can, subscribe because it's a fantastic show. And, uh, and aloha from the Rincon Room. Cheers. Aloha. You want to switch sides? Uh, just for a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, you say, oh, that was? Yeah. Oh, you want to go back to your side? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> just tell me when you want action. <laughs> so you have a, you have a true, so you have a, uh, what's it called? So you have a, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> you did have almost kind of a second, second career. Let me say it again. Very nice of you. I used to be nice. Oh. I don't do that anymore. Mr. Crafty. Doug Horn. Oh. That was his original name was Mr. Craft. No way. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't care if I say that, do you, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Ron, thank you so much for joining me once again on Spike's Breezeway Cocktail Hour, or for the first time on Spike's Breezeway Cocktail Let me just do that whole thing over. It's a great cocktail. Thank you. Yeah.
Can you tell us the Walt Disney story now? The toupee story? The no, 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 the <laughs> Walt Disney. <laughs> the Walt Disney story. Well, I want to hear that one too. Yes, I can say, you want to hear it on camera? <laughs> I was pretty young, so whenever Swiss Family Robinson came out and Disneyland was building the uh, Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse, mm -hmm. is we had gone to Disneyland with a family, and so it was my brother and my sister, she was very little, my mom and dad, and so we're walking towards Adventureland, and here's this construction site outside, and just kind of like a framework for the tree, and as we're walking up, there's uh, like a contractor out there, and there's another gentleman, they're looking at plans. And my dad goes, do you know who that is? And I said, who? And he says, that's Walt Disney, you know, oh on God. Wonderful World of Color, Walt Disney, Disneyland. And we go, oh. And he sees us and he comes over, but it's got, got like a chain link fence around it. He comes up to the fence and he introduces himself no and he way. asks our name. Oh. He says, do you know what we're doing here? And I said, no. And he says, have you kids seen Swiss Family? Robinson. And I said, oh my gosh, I love that movie. Yeah. I love the being stranded on an island. He goes, well, we're bringing the treehouse here. Wow. So make sure you come back and see it when it's done. Wow. And then he walked away. And it was oh. Like, but of course, as a kid, I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, just whatever. Walk away. Yeah. It's just Walt Disney. Yeah. yeah. So, but in hindsight, you go, oh my, that's an incredible encounter. Yeah. yeah I mean, how often does that happen? Oh, man.